evening, and uh, welcome to this year's Nanofic Institute uh, Distinguished Lecture. Um, where one, it's wonderful to see all of you here. I'm Jim McAdams, by the way. I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute. And this is really uh, one of the high points of our academic year. And when you listen to our lecturer tonight, you will see why. <coughs> I was thinking as uh, I was reflecting on what I should say in a brief introduction tonight, um, who could have imagined that only a few years ago, the man who unsuccessfully ran for president of the United States and turned out not to be the inventor of the internet <laughs> would have produced a film about climate change and environmental disasters that would have become the fourth highest grossing documentary in U.S. history. Then he would win two Academy Awards and then amazingly be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Who would have imagined this only a few years ago? Or actually, I should say, maybe only a few months ago, in some way. Um, whatever one thinks about the film, and I'm eager to have somebody here ask our speaker about the film, because, um, well, you'll see. Uh, whatever one thinks about the film, The Inconvenient Truth has made 2000, in many ways, the year of the environment where issues like carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases, not to mention global warming, have become topics of increased consciousness and debate, not only among scientists, policymakers, but average American citizens like us. In fact, even at Notre Dame, the issue of the environment has been raised a little bit, uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Importantly, a couple of weeks ago. We're hoping that it will return. I gather next year, in the fall, it will return again and hopefully be a regular part of our discussions here. Now, as we know, some states in the world have been slower to recognize many of the issues that we're going to discuss tonight than others. North Korea, Yemen, Iran, other countries. Um, but interestingly, this can't be said about Europe. Now, this is something that has always stood out to me, where for at least 20 years, 30 years, there has been a consensus among all political parties in Europe and opinion leaders that governments have a positive responsibility to take proactive and corrective steps to protect the environment. And this is undoubtedly due to the fact that if you live in Europe, the proximity of states is so close, and what happens to your uh, neighbors invariably happens to you. And for Europeans, they see the polluted rivers that run through many countries. They see the blackened trees um, quite visibly. Um, many years ago, decades ago, I was in Berlin at the time that Chernobyl imploded, and I had many thoughts that evening about, as did many Germans, about radioactive clouds um, going over us. So that, you know, in Europe, this is a constant theme. Uh, but as you also know, states alone cannot be the solution to environmental problems and challenges. We think about interest groups, we think about NGOs, international bodies, and of course, corporate, of course, corporations, which is the subject of our presentation tonight. Uh, our speaker is Professor Gordon Clark, uh, clearly one of the most suitable, most suited individuals in the world to comment on this topic. Uh, professor Clark is the Halford McKinder Professor of Geography and the head of uh, Oxford University Center for the Environment and is also a professorial fellow of St. Peter's College. Prior to his appointment in 1995, he held teaching and research positions at Harvard University, we've heard of that university, uh, the University of Chicago, Carnegie Mellon, Monash, and so forth. He is an elected fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, he's a fellow of the British Academy, and he's an academician of the UK Academy of Social Sciences. 
He's written, I was looking at his resume, many, many, many books and articles, and I will only mention the most recent title, The Geography of Finance, Corporate Governance in the Global Marketplace. He's also been a consultant to our government, the British government, uh, the French government, the Canadian government, major steel corporations. This is the whole gamut of possible people you can talk to, <laughs> financial service companies and the like. And tonight, Professor uh, Clark will talk about the carbon footprint of the modern corporation, a European perspective. So please join me in welcoming our speaker. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much, Jim. Tonight, I'm going to talk about something that's pretty dear to my heart, and I'll do that first by way of the introduction. Um, I want to, in part, make it a little bit personal, but then I want to get on to the hard graft of being an academic, and that is to talk some aspects about European policymaking, plus in relation to the United Kingdom. In doing so, I want to talk about the carbon footprint of modern corporations, and it's something that I do a lot of, talking to either corporations or talking to NGOs about corporations, talking to NGOs and corporations about the things that they want to uh, fix. But I want to convince you that the modern corporation is an important variable in thinking about the future of the environment. Because in many respects, if corporations can't solve their environmental problems or indeed mitigate their footprint, we're going to have a great deal of difficulty over the 21st century making any appreciable difference to the rate of climate or rather rate of global warming. So with that to begin with, I want to thank you all for the invitation to come here today. It's a privilege to be here and to talk about an issue of such great significance, and I got a lot out of talking to the undergraduates this morning at uh, breakfast and a lot out of talking to the graduate students and kind of the sense of how important it is to you. And I know in uh, my own program at Oxford, uh, undergraduate and graduate students really are a remarkable audience about these issues. And um, in, in many, I'll come on to talk a little bit about why I think that's the case and why I'm somewhat, uh, I'm a cautious optimist about these things. What we're talking about is really the future prospects of everybody in this room. And to personalize it, I often think about the future prospects of my own son. He's 19, just started university in, in London, but I also think about his children and his children's children, etc. One of the interesting things is when you talk about people, talk to people about how far they can look into the future. They see it through the lens of their children and their children's children. And of course, given longevity, the fact that we're all going to, and you all are going to live to more than 80 on average, or maybe 85 or 90 on average, we're nearly talking now of nearly a sweep 200 years. We're looking a long way in the future when we look through our children's children's futures. And I think there's reason to be, um, well, um, there's reason to be worried about their futures. And I want to talk a little bit about how that com comes to pass, but I also want to talk about uh, what might be done and what the European response has been to some of the issues Jim talked about. That is to say, why is it the Europeans... Uh, have been in the regulatory game about carbon footprints of corporations for such a long period of time. It's not only that this is an, a, an issue of great significance for Western societies, um, but it's also immensely important in terms of our responsibility for other parts of the world that may be more vulnerable to the worst effects of global warming. And in lots of ways, it is somewhat of a it's a bit of a cheek to get up here and talk about Western Europe talking about climate and global warming when, in fact, some of the worst consequences are going to be visited upon sub-Saharan Africa over this century. And that the catastrophes of, of, of 
disease, the catastrophes of lack of water, the catastrophes of uh, lack of food are really going to basically accentuate the debate about what is our responsibility for other places, notwithstanding our responsibilities for ourselves. We may be actually uh, Western Europe, North America, best place, if you like, to help the rest of the world. But notice we will do that, I think, in the context of an enormous, um, enormous conflict and, and uh, uh, maybe even catastrophe on these types of issues. We're going to face the prospect of, in 2050, dealing with many, many millions of people displaced by climate, by global warming, by the fact that they have nothing to eat or drink. These, I think, are the prospects for my son, and these are the prospects then of how my son's children themselves are going to deal with the second half of the 21st century. I think there's a gathering consensus represented by the IPCC and other academic bodies like the UK Royal Society about the significance of human-induced global warming. That's not to say there aren't physical processes contributing, but I do believe that human-induced global warming is significant. By many accounts, warming is already here and will accelerate over the coming decades of this century. The challenge is for us to respond locally, nationally, internationally, even though we may not be able to stop global warming. The challenge really is to decrease the rate of warming. But can we, in fact, limit the rate of warming? That, I think, is a challenge politically to many societies. It's a challenge to us economically in the sense of conceiving different ways of doing business. And can we limit the rate of warming? Can we mitigate the worst effects of warming and basically affect the welfare of humanity outside, if you like, the golden triangle or the golden life, basically, of North America and Western Europe? And that's, I think, a big challenge. I've been convinced by my scientific colleagues of the significance of global warming, notwithstanding continuing debate about its scope. And it's actually quite a striking thing. My experience in running the program at Oxford was to go into the program 10 years ago with some, well, this is a sort of interesting thing. I'm a social scientist. I can do most things, I guess, about policy and policy-related issues. And then over time to be convinced by my scientific colleagues to basically join their world and then come to lead their world because I do personally believe that this is a very significant issue. At Oxford, we have sought ways to build intellectual and institutional capacity to promote leadership and responsibility locally and globally. We've basically sought to try and mobilize the university to be, take advantage, if you like, of its global position to talk about such a global issue. And I think it's not not necessarily something a complacent organisation is likely to do, but nonetheless I think we've been somewhat successful. I'm a cautious optimist in this sense. I believe we can translate commitment into relevant solutions, but recognising there's no sort of magic solution out there. There's no sort of magic way of sort of tomorrow stopping global warming. It's really a question, will we dampen the rate of increase such that we'll look back or you will look back in 2050 or 2060 and say, actually, we made a difference to the rate of increase. Moreover, I think as a cautious optimist, one of the paradoxes that you face is that we must work with what we've inherited. We've inherited market economies and their institutions, what we have to do is work through them, if you like, to transform policies and practices from a short-run orientation to a long-run orientation. And that is what I think my long-run orientation is. It's out 50 years, but equally I'm concerned about my children's children's children. That's really long-run. And yet if you talk to the average corporate uh, CEO, they're talking about quarter to quarter, you know, <laughs> This is, this is a pretty small sort of time horizon that they have in mind. Now, partly, of course, they've 
as we know, have got the promise of um, great payoff for such a focus. But really what we have to do is find ways of transforming their short run to join our long run. And we have to think of ways how you do that in a regulatory <coughs> manner. Why am I a cautious optimist? Because I think partly I'm convinced by my experience, the vision, belief and commitment of new generations of students from around the world can be simply breathtaking. It's remarkable to me, in fact, that the biggest and best audience for the things I want to talk, to, talk about are really from the age of 16 to 36, right? When I go into an audience talking to people over the age of 60, they kind of look at me like, don't bother me, you know? When I talk about our children's children's children, they say, but what about us? We're owed something by our children. And I'm trying to get them to see, actually, it's what we owe our children, not the other way around. So being a cautious optimist, I'm an optimist really about the commitment of people in this room. Equally, I've come to recognize that these issues have been taken up by business and government leaders with surprising commitment, not to say all of them, all the time, but that combination of business leaders and government combined with media coverage tends to be a kind of a magic little circle. So I've talked to some of the worst polluters in the world. Cement manufacturers are actually a shocking example of, of, of contributors to CO2 emission, but one of the most remarkable groups of people who are kind of trying to do something positive about the situation. There have been remarkable instances of global cooperation, commitment, and we see that through the G8 in Africa. And even when we encounter indifferences, indifference and cynicism, the private funding of leadership programs at leading institutions such as this, I might hazard in the future, suggests that there's gathering momentum. And again, we were faced recently at Oxford, someone came to us and and said, how about we give you a lot of money if you build a enterprise and environment program? Because he wants to, us to enroll business leaders from around the world in this dialogue about how you go from the short run to the long run. And that kind of commitment is not something you get from governments. Governments don't come to us and say, here's a hell of a lot of money, get on and do the environment. Right? It's actually businesses who are coming to us and asking us, to do this kind of thing. And I think this is one of the great um, sort of problems that we face, is that in many respects, and I'll come on to this about the UK government particularly, the UK government about environmental policy shelters under the European Union's actually aggressive environmental policy. On its own, the UK government would not be near as courageous if it didn't have the European Union to kind of drive the story onwards. Of course, cautious optimists can be accused of naivety and complacency. There are many who question the status quo, arguing that globalization, the growth of financial markets, trade, have all accelerated global warming. Really, there's a question out there that's made very profound, is whether or not, in fact, capitalism, market economies, are consistent with a good environment, and that there are many people who argue the global corporation as the embodiment of global capitalism is, in fact, the problem. And here, especially in Europe, with strong social democratic traditions, strong states, regulated markets, restraints on property, property rights, you get a sense that actually we ought to be reining in far more tightly the global corporation, far more tightly around, if you like, community norms, far more tightly around, if you like, a sense of what the public interest is in the future. This is not to say that scientists and social scientists all agree about the rate of warming. Few agree about the nature of proper solutions. Few agree about what is the role of states and markets. And in fact, one way to kind of picture this is that when you get a group of scientists, climate modelers, in a room and ask them, well, how do you think the global climate system works, well, that's basically a recipe for a fight. You 
know, some people think it works this way, some people think it's that way, some people have a tipping point where it all goes to hell very, very quickly, other people say, no, that's not right. There is a great deal of debate about this, and one wouldn't, and I wouldn't want you all left with the view at the end of tonight, that actually there's nothing to be done about the science and social science about, of global warming. Here is your career for the next 50 years, right? Because it is such a, an astounding kind of research frontier. But as I'm trying to say, it's also the hum, humanities frontier. And I think that combination is why you get such passion on the side of the scientists and the social scientists about the issue. There are clearly disputes between nation states over targets for CO2 emissions. There are conflicts over timetables for implementation of treaties if you've signed up to them. And there are conflict over incentives and sanctions. There is a great deal of debate about these issues. Even so, in the UK, the Stern Report, which I sort of strongly recommend to every person in this, in this room, the Stern Report that was basically sponsored by the UK government as an independent assessment of the issues, the Stern Report argued that it's best to act now rather than in 50 years. The costs of doing nothing and waiting for 50 years may be astronomical, which suggests, directly or indirectly, that the time frames of private institutions, such as corporations, must be dramatically altered to account for this time horizon about climate change. One approach that aims at integrating short-run behavior with long-run climate change is what comes under the heading of the disclosure movement. This is a movement basically aimed at getting corporations to come clean about what their carbon footprint is. The disclosure movement is arguably a private initiative in Europe led by NGOs and financial institutions such as large pension funds and institutional investors. The goal of the disclosure movement is to encourage corporations to disclose their carbon footprints and thereby prompt changes in their policies and practices. If it comes to pass that a major corporation has a footprint that looks like X, an X is big. And for example, I was just talking over dinner, one of the corporations whose footprint is actually huge is Lafarge, the French cement manufacturer. Now it turns out the cement industry is one of the most egregious pollu uh, polluters, or rather the most egregious producers of CO2 emissions. Once the argument is, once that footprint becomes public knowledge, then there's pressure, if you like, to be placed on those in institutions. In play in the disclosure movement is the public interest in the environment, the trust or distrust of corporations, and the value attributed to a corporate reputation, or more particularly the reputation of a CEO. The group who are also leading this is through the UNEP and through a group of UK and European institutional investors under the heading of the Principles for Responsible Investment. This initiative, that is organising together the investment industry to try and drive, if you like, standards for responsible investment, have in mind responsible investment differentiating between corporations on the basis of their carbon footprint. There's, if you like, a gathering group of these institutions concerned about the long term, arguing that the corporations are far too, far too short term oriented, and the, these financial institutions are trying to drive the disclosure by the corporations. The UN Principles for Responsible Investment has been actually quite a remarkable success. It's gained enormous publicity. They've gained people, many corporations have signed up to it. But as we heard this morning, I guess those of you in the audience with the United Nations this morning, uh, it can be said that the signing up to it is actually quite differentiated. Not that many American corporations, but many European corporations. And we'll get on in a minute to explain why. 
What's being referenced here through the principles for a responsible investment is the responsibility of institutional investors to act in the best long-term interests of beneficiaries in a manner consistent with fiduciary duty. What's being done here is the reinterpretation of what is the responsibility of an investor to look not just short-term but long-term, to look over the life, if you like, of the beneficiary of an insurance policy or a pension policy. In 2005, a commitment was made to six principles, most of which are about economic, social and governance disclosure issues. The metrics of measurement, how do you measure these issues, and company reporting, what these financial institutions expect. With a commitment to act on these issues publicly, and in the US that would mean through proxy voting at annual general meetings, aimed at corporate boards of directors, but also privately through engaging these corporations through direct conversation about what an investor expects and what their behaviour is. It is clear that comprehensive, comparable and consistent disclosure is very important for financial reporting standards. Those companies reporting their footprints would do so in the hope of prom promoting, basically, the growth of European and global carbon markets. A quantitative estimate of a company's environmental footprint is essential for the market pricing and ultimately the trade in carbon offsets and permits. But it is also important for institutional investors seeking to value companies, industries and whole economies in terms of long-term value. You can only value in a financial sense what the underlying liability load is of a corporation if you know what the load is. And curiously, I, I, I would always think that this would be a government responsibility, but remarkably, what we see being developed in London and New York are these start-up companies, venture capital entities, who are basically there to try and estimate for the 12,000 largest traded companies around the world what that footprint is in a quantitative sense. Now, you would have thought it would have been the governments that would have rushed to do this, but actually what it is are private financial interests who are trying to meet, if you like, their sense that if they don't have a quantitative estimate of what a carbon footprint looks like for a corporation, they can't adequately value its long-term uh, uh, value, market value. The European approach, and here I'm going to sort of go on now and talk about how the Europeans have got into this world. So far I've emphasised the development of the disclosure movement and the market for disclosure. By my account, interest in these issues has been driven by a select group of European financial institutions as if the nation state is irrelevant. In what follows, I look more closely at related developments in the EU and what I want to emphasise is the incorporation of environmental issues into mainstream corporate reporting through European legislation. The European Union has been interested in environmental policy for a long time. Article 6 of the Amsterdam Treaty of 1997 recognised the principle of integrating environmental requirements into other European Union policies. In 1999, the Commission announced a policy aimed at ensuring environmental policies are consistent with an integrated market. This is the mantra, basically, of the European Union. We are building, if you like, an integrated economy that's going to contain about 350 million people, all of them consumers, right? You've got to understand the European Union is an economic project as much as it is a political project. In May 2001, the Commission made recommendations so as to provide comprehensive guidance on environmental disclosure. And this is the first time, basically, the European Union comes to the table about the disclosure issue. What is it that actually corporations are doing? What is the value you might attribute to their carbon footprints, amongst other things? Also, I must say, the European Union at the same time is interested in the liability. That is, what, is a, what has a corporation done in the past that has created environmental harm? 
what is that liability? How can you price that liability against its stock value? In particular, the Commission made a specific reference to the disclosure of environmental risks and liabilities as they pertain to companies' financial performance. This is not just a European Union phenomenon, it is also a US phenomenon. Some of the best legislation around, historically at least, about environmental liability, strict liability, has come from the United States. The issue that you have to think about is why is it the United States really from the mid-1990s onwards basically start to lose the story about environment, right? And it is partly a political issue, but partly it's about sort of a global position going on about who is the leader on the environment versus not. And I would argue, actually, in lots of ways, the European Union has seen the environment as one of their litmus tests of global influence, recognising the United States has been reluctant to get involved in the standard-setting process, the global standard-setting process. And it sort of nature of, of whores a vacuum, given that the United States ceded leadership in terms of environmental legislation, they ceded that uh, responsibility to the European Union. European Union have taken it up with gusto. In 2003, the European Union moved to harmonise accounting practices, eliminate inconsistencies with international accounting standards, and encourage convergence towards principles-based accounting. More on this in a moment. Annual reports must now include a fair review of the company's performance, including a description of the principal risks and uncertainties facing the firm. There must be basically a narrative description of what it is the company faces now and in the future. And of course, in many companies, manufacturing companies, one of the biggest risks they face is actually what to do with their inherited environmental liability and what to do on terms of carbon, uh, their carbon um, commitments. For an adequate description of a company's business, the annual report shall also include financial and, quote, where appropriate, non-financial indicators, which includes information relating to environmental and social matters broadly interpreted. And in fact, there has been a big debate in the European Union about constraining that phrase, environmental and social matters. Should it be narrow? Should it be broad? And of course, in in an, in an environment or in a, in a sort of setting like the European Union where there is the strong social democratic traditions, some distrust of corporations, the interpretation of environmental and social conditions have been basically expanded all the time to try and take in, if you like, the full scope of a global corporation. Not only are they declaring what they do, say, in Germany, but they're declaring what they do in South Africa. They're trying to broaden the scope of reporting of European domiciled corporations to include wherever they are. So the corporation in 60 countries in the world are basically having to come to Europe to tell the story about what they do in these different jurisdictions. The principles-based uh, approach to reporting is based on the notion of a balanced and comprehensive analysis consistent with the size and complexity of the business. Again, what this is all aimed at is the leading global corporations. With a broad conception of performance indicators allowing for qualitative and quantitative measures. But it is reliant upon member states to implement and to ensure compliance through their own legislation and regulation. Once you've put in place these regulatory regimes, in the European context, what it does, it steps down to the nation states to implement. And I want to talk about how the UK has done that in a moment. Where member states are permitted, in fact, to exempt some companies from these requirements in the, insofar as they pertain to non-financial information. Of course, the European Directive on Reporting was not particularly about the environment or social standards. In part, it's driven by a long-term project of single market integration initiated by the Treaty of Rome. In part, it's driven by the apparent need to harmonise member countries' corporate governance and reporting practices with respect to global markets. Just as important, it's driven by the fallout from recent corporate governance failures. 
the directive on reporting that then includes environmental and social matters is basically meeting a whole variety of constituencies. It's meeting the social democratic constituency suspicious of a global corporation as it's meeting a global financial community's interest in having reported the most important aspects that affect the stock market price of a company. And in a curious way, you get the left and the right of the political spectrum in Europe joining hands on that one thing that they can agree on, the reporting of environmental and social matters on a global basis. And it's not surprising then, it's picked up with some gusto because you have a global financial interest thinking that oh, this is a good thing, this is how we value a firm, whereas the left of the political spectrum in Europe says, well, of course that's what you do, right? Of course that's how you understand, actually, the full weight of a global corporation. Likewise, the UK, the 2006 UK Companies Act has comparable language to the European Union Directive, including a balanced and comprehensive analysis consistent with the size and complexity of the firm. The Companies Act of 2006 requires companies to report, to disclose relevant in information insofar as it's necessary for understanding the current fu future development of the firm including reference to the principal risks and uncertainties facing the company. With explicit reference to environmental matters, the company's environmental impact and the social and community interests. In effect, basically, the UK took off the shelf the 2003 U European Union Directive and kind of incorporated it into a rewritten 2006 Companies Act. A controversial issue during the passage of the Act was the wider scope of directors' duties. You're effectively asking a, a director to report on things that they know nothing about. What does a company do in some country in Africa on the environment? Well, these guys don't go there. So that requires an incredible reporting apparatus which ensures consistency from the bottom of the company through the top to the boardroom. And it's not surprising on two issues. Boards of directors have gone into subcommittee structures. And this will warm Teresa's heart. One is, of course, on the global environmental footprint. And guess what the other one is on? It's the global pension liability. <laughs> now, at that point, my heart is warmed since, uh, since I do research on the pensions and the environment issue. And I see that these big corporations are basically having to frame these, these subcommittees to basically learn about what their company does in the rest of the world. The Act places significant responsibilities on company directors to promote the success of the company for the benefits of the members as a whole. Now, what's the member of a company? Well, who is that? That turns out to be employees, not just shareholders. It doesn't talk about stakeholders, which is European code for the social partners, read unions. But what it does is talk about members in a sense of the community that the corporation should in otherwise take account of. Members is code for actually including the rest of us in the conversation about what the corporation do. Directors must in particular have regard to the long-term consequences of their decisions and the company's impact on the environment and the community. Only medium-sized listed companies need not provide information on key non-financial indicators. In other words, you know, they, they were convinced by the small medium enterprise constituency that this would all force them out of business. This represents a major development in UK company law and an advance for those who advocate corporate social responsibility. In fact, the UK Companies Act is the first explicit codification of directors' duties regarding corporate social responsibility. It reflects the Labor government's goal of promoting the environmental transformation of companies and consumers. They basically want to get companies to report their carbon footprint and they want to get us to basically buy and sell their products produced on the basis of 
while that looks like a good company in relation to carbon footprint, that looks like a bad company. They want to create a list of good and bad companies that you and I will go out to the supermarket and go down the shelves and differentiate. Now, that's a grand ambition. Including, so it reflects this Labor government's goal, but it also includes a commitment to a long-term corporate impact reporting structure, particularly with respect to environmental interests at home and abroad, and an attempt to place the UK at the centre of green reporting as a business in itself. Both the EU Directive and the UK Companies Act allow for qualitative and quantitative reporting with respect to the scope of the environment. But neither the EU Directive nor the UK Companies Act are explicit about the precise nature and quality of environmental reporting. In fact, I talked to the person responsible in the House of Lords for the passage of the Act, and they said that they would have set precise reporting criteria if only they could have got somebody to agree what that criteria should look like. So they basically left it to the corporations to go about basically build their own reporting systems, and they're leaving it basically to the corporations competing with one another to what the standard setting process should look like. Right? Now, that could be a race to the bottom, like reports could be awful, but actually it only takes a few businesses to do something actually quite tangibly good for a sort of peer group competition process. Add to the fact that actually there's a lot of consulting companies who want to help you out in doing the corporate reporting. What you're doing is building an industry on the reporting side. This remains a significant issue, that is actually the reporting structures for financial institutions and their clients concerned the price and trade company carving le legacies. Hence, the leading edge on this matter remains with a small cadre of financial institutions and market agents. And it is remarkable to us to have conversations with these groups that are doing the carbon counting process and trying to sell the product through Merrill Lynch or whoever to companies who want to do investment on that basis. At the moment, we have many companies competing basically to be the standard setter for carbon reporting. Now, even a cautious optimist should be alarmed at the thought that we must rely on market agents to lead the drive for disclosure of carbon footprints. More often than not, it is UK and European companies that are proactive about climate change, being concerned about their public reputations. Many fund managers see climate change as a slow and cumulative process reaching far beyond the time frames of conventional investment mandates. So, in fact, is it 2010 or is it 2050? When you're going to rely on financial markets to be the driver behind the reporting process, you've got to understand that most of them, almost everybody, has a day-to-day, quarter-to-quarter, year-to-year reporting structure. When asked, often ignorance and cynicism prevails while responsibility is deflected to government to provide a stable legal framework for meeting the challenge. So the cautious optimist, me, recognising that there is a, a growing market for disclosure, must also face the fact that actually many market agents find this actually quite irrelevant to their business. So I want to now uh, close, because I want time for some questions, but I want to close on a couple of different ways. First, I want to draw some implications about what I've been talking about, but also then talk a little bit about public consciousness, which I think is extremely important. Strong public consciousness of global warming is, in my view, vital for promoting further European Union debate over the issues and more exacting legislation by the European Commission. I think, personally, that it is the combination of an environmental consciousness, consciousness in Europe, and perhaps it's Chernobyl, perhaps it's basically the Rhine River turning different colours between different countries, perhaps it's the fact that actually it's quite pleasant and you don't want to see it despoiled, but there is a long-term environmental consciousness there. 
It's the fact of the environmental consciousness combined with a corporate sense of social responsibility driven by the left, if you like, of social democratic interests that kind of shifts the pendulum towards the reporting structure rather than not reporting. But I think without the strong public consciousness, this would not be happening. We want more exacting legislation by the European Commission. But as I said, one of the crucial parts of, the of having legislation is to have clear, coherent reporting standards. And here we're going to continue to rely on market agents. Relying on strong published public consciousness is apparent in other European Union initiatives, including recent directives on corporate environmental liabilities and eco-design. We have really, as I said at the start, this gathering momentum of environmental legislation, which is effectively global market leaders in relation to the United States, which once claimed the high ground in terms of setting environmental regulations. As a consequence, the European Union will lead member countries and challenge their policies and practices as well as established interests. Here, specifically, the European Union and European Commission initiatives on environmental policy are done for the European Union and Commission's political benefit. Right? It is clear that the European Union gets a huge return politically from setting the standard. It's member countries that have to implement these policies. And implementing policies of environmental standards in a member country is often only a political cost. So in a sense, this is the dynamic of standard setting in Europe. One level, the European Union level, sets high standards which the, which the nation states, the member states, wouldn't have the political courage to implement. And there's a reason why the UK Companies Act looks a lot like the European Union directive is because the Labour government can blame Europe for forcing them to implement this policy. Right? Cynical way of looking at it, perhaps, but it's clear about the politics. The politics at the local level about trading off environment and development have historically always gone development side. Once you scale it up to the European Union level, where they don't actually have to deal with the local politics of development, they have a political clean slate, if you like, in setting higher standards. Long-term solutions. We should recognise, moreover, the coexistence of very different conceptions amongst European countries regarding the proper role of the corporation. That is to say, in play is a debate about the corporation itself, even so, there remain strong democratic forces that would impose on corporations responsibility for long-term solutions, as well as claims on governments to promote research and development in the search for long-term cultural and technological solutions. All this is informed in many cases by deep-seated anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist ideologies that focus on corporate responsibility. We have, if you like, the left of the political spectrum joined up on the environment that is basically exerting pressure both on the corporation and on the nation states. And that argument is given voice through the European Union policymaking process. One moment. Conclusion. The significance of climate change and undercurrents of ideology and commitment suggest an emerging European consensus in favour of stronger regulation. And as I suggested, recent directives on eco-design, recent directives on uh, corporate environmental liability are representative of this. This is likely to continue to develop, including the promotion of disclosure, the counting of carbon, and a pan-European, even global, carbon trading platform. This movement is closely related to debate over the roles and responsibilities, even the purpose of corporations. That is to say, it's not just about the short term, it's about the long term. If it's about the long term, what is the mandate a corporation carries into the global economy? That mandate has its roots, if you like, in obligations to community and nation. 
which is in a sense a way of discounting claims for short-term economic success for longer term, for a longer-term perspective, where European companies are held to account for their contribution to the common good, and indeed European companies become the standard bearers for setting global standards. Thank you very much. So, uh, that was terrific. Very interesting. Uh, we have time for questions. And as always, we go with students first. <laughs> for uh, the United States, doesn't have that overarching structure like the European Union. Do you see any political solutions that could come out of the states? Um, where you said the Labour government in Britain can deflect it to a higher body and says we have to do this because they said so. What about for the states? It's, it's a very interesting question, and um, historically in the United States, um, the federal government and indeed the Senate has been thought to be this removed entity from the play of local politics about environment and development. And it is surprising to me that people have lost sight of the role of the Senate, particularly as that institution for if you like, giving voice to the collective good outside of the, if you like, the, the local politics of making good on interests and making good on constituents. Whether or not that, you know, it's interesting that that debate has been lost in the debate about the environment, that actually the federal government has become implicated in the local interests rather than removed from the local interests. And for example, I'll, I'll give you an analogous situation. The, the passage of NAFTA is clearly in the interests of a lot of different people. You know, I think economic, global, inter I personally think economic, political integration is a good thing. I think global integration is a good thing. I th and I think that because what I'm trying to deal with is the poverty of people outside the magic circle of developed economies. Now, why is it the federal government can see through the passage of NAFTA but on the environment, which is even more removed, if you like, from local interests, the government feels so implicated with corporations and protecting American corporate interests. I think that says something about the politics of the situation at the moment. But I'm also saying it need not be like that in the long term. It doesn't mean to say that all governments should be so implicated with major corporations. this whole disclosure thing will actually go in terms of creating um, public consciousness uh, to ultimately reduce their carbon footprints. Because it seems to me that, you know, while people are like publicly conscious of what these corporations are doing, that can only take you so far um, in terms of reducing the footprint. Whereas like state solutions like taxes on CO2 emissions might actually <coughs> get you all the way there. Yeah, I, I think that's a good question. Um, I've been interested in how environmentally conscious the average consumer is, for example. And I've been going, doing interviews with um, some of the more uh, boutique uh, marketing companies in, in London. In fact, it's quite an experience because those companies have themselves a global presence. For example, they, um, they uh, consult with Procter & Gamble and companies like that. So I asked the question, how many amongst us are environmentally conscious? What is the proportion, right? I want to know, is it 50% of us, is it 60% of us? I said, Gordon, you're such an optimist. It's 20% on a good day. So, okay, so there's 20% there's of us willing to basically spend our consumer dollar or our consumer pound or euro that has a deliberate environmental element, right? So that's a fairly pessimistic take on things. And it does say to me that if you're going to be successful in mobilizing consumers about the environment, you actually have to have a quality good that meets the qualities of consumer products that you would otherwise demand. Right? It must be price competitive in relation to the qualities. So that's one of the big lessons for me. Second thing, though, is what we see gathering is an attempt to mobilize the other 80%, the rest of us, if you like. And there's a kind of variety of different ways that's happening. 
in the European Union, the Eco Design Directive, has it that all companies in their products would have a certification which is a CE insignia on their products that represent conformity with the European Union Directive on Eco Design. Now, I'm not saying we're all going to rush out looking for the CE, but it is very important when you recognize that in my own supermarket, just around the corner, people go down the aisles looking for evidence of how far the product that they're about to buy has flown to get to the supermarket. Right? There is this astoundingly mistaken view that actually in flying a long way to get to a consumer shelves is necessarily bad for the environment. Right? It's not always true. Actually, it turns out that the UK should not produce lamb and we should all import it from New Zealand. You know, it's just better environmentally, even though it comes a long distance. But nonetheless, what we do notice is consumers going down the shelves and picking out the products and the distance the products have come from. And if you can mobilize that consciousness and latch on to eco-labeling, then you've got a chance of mobilizing perhaps another 25 to 30% of the population. That gets us up to 50, right? That's as far as I can see in terms of the average person because then I think what you have to start thinking about is regulations that really affect then the production of the product itself so that you actually strip out of the production system the environmental load. But to do that means you're not talking about the short term, you're talking about technological change in production cycles that are going to go over 5 to 10 to 15 years. And that unfortunately takes us a little bit too far into my son's children's futures. So I'm, you know, I don't think, I think it's a product of both things, regulation and consumer awareness. But I'm a realist about consumer awareness. Who was in the audience this morning when that was said by the ambassador from Pakistan, I'm a realist. God, that was frightening, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Yeah. Well, it seems like America will be slow to um, adapt to you know, um, regulation without some kind of big scare. But do you see the European Union leading the world um, into a position where um, an environmental rating for a country will be viewed similarly to like an economic rating is for investors. Like I know that American investors um, will invest based on like a, a rating for a country's economy, especially in the third world. How about for environmental policies and procedures, especially in Asia? I think um, I, I'll tackle a question in a couple of ways. What we have out there are these venture capital sponsored companies building basically big databases on the carbon footprint of about 12,000 traded companies in the world. When I say 12,000 traded companies, that means there's at least 4,000 of which are American. Right? So as that goes on and that sort of counting up the carbon and counting it against stock price, if it's significant, may well come to be a penalty on companies domiciled in the United States who otherwise aren't at the leading edge of environmental management or environmental technology. That's a possibility. All being well, that is to say that financial markets value against fundamentals, all being well that the environmental load is significant. So with a graduate student and I, we started looking at what kinds of companies carry that kind of load. And not surprisingly, it's utility companies, commodity companies, manufacturing companies, industrial companies. Um, it's not significant for retail companies, financial companies, perhaps that's why they're interested. Um, you know, uh, retail companies, unless you look back into their supply chains. So it will be a very exacting kind of equation 
that picks up some types of industries and some types of firms, and it will leave out of the picture a lot of other kind of non-manufacturing, non-load type firms. And at that point, I think you face really the fact that this counting up carbon is going to aim at one segment of global production and will leave out of the picture another segment of global production. But what's interesting on that other segment of global production, the companies that don't have this large footprint, is that they themselves may face reputation problems unless they sign up to basically environmental protocols. And in fact, for those companies, it's quite cheap. And I, th I think you can see a world evolving where the debate in the United States or in Britain or in Europe about should we have carbon footprinting, it won't be a concerted no amongst all corporations because actually it's only going to be a certain segment of corporations that are going to be burdened where a lot of other corporations will benefit in terms of consumer virtue in signing up to these protocols. And I think then actually the constituency starts to fracture in, on the corporation side, resisting, if you like, the disclosure movement. Now, I sort of hope that. But, but it, is, it is clear, you know, when we started counting up industries and firms, it was very clear that there are many included in the tent and excluded out of the tent. Yeah. And uh, livestock, uh, whole guy livestock production, with the methane and nitrous oxide, would that be converted to CO2 equivalents to determine the carbon footprint? That, that, that is a, um, a wonderful long-term prospect. I think very difficult to conceptualize, in fact, very difficult to even count, very difficult to give it a source. The reason why carbon footprinting works is that you've got an entity, an owned entity, with production sites, with product particularities. When you go to agriculture writ large, and let's talk about the Midwest, I don't know, pork industry, it's very hard to do the same kind of counting because you're not attaching it necessarily to a specific firm. You're attaching it to a whole industry in a, in a kind of an un, un sort of bounded sense. So carbon footprinting then is very, very difficult. Not to say people won't try and do it, but it won't have the same resonance for financial markets as it is counting up the footprint, for example, GE. You know, that's going to be significant. Yeah. Essentially a voluntary scheme? Yes. Well, uh, uh, it's, it started off as a voluntary scheme, the European Union directives will have it as a mandatory scheme. What's still not mandatory is what is, how do you measure the footprint? Because no one quite knows how to do that. So it starts off voluntary, but the European Union coming in has effectively made it mandatory, but with a big but, and the but is how do you measure it in a consistent way so that everyone agrees. And that's where the competition is, if you like, in the financial industry at the moment. I think I'll uh, take the opportunity to ask the final question, which is, uh, so what did you think about Al Gore's book? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of a setup. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> well, on one, one level, I, I, I told um, Jim the story that I was in Toronto recently, and one of my friend's um, children, th three off, went off to see Al Gore in a lecture theatre of 1,400 people. And this is 16 to 18-year-olds. Gee, you know, I can't think of a better way of mobilising my constituency for the long term. All come to Oxford, I think, is what he might have said at the end. Um, but I do think he's, he's been tremendously important in mobilising younger people about the issue. As I said, you know, I go around talking about these, these issues um, it falls on deaf ears when I talk to people basically 60 and older. Because they don't talk about actually what we owe our children. They talk about actually what their children owe them. And I think that is a real profound problem. Now, I haven't seen Al Gore's film because I couldn't face sitting there getting angry with him about where I felt he went wrong. 
right? And, you know, there's a hell of a lot of debate about these issues. Hell of a lot of debate about how does the climate system work? What is cause and effect? Is the system of climate structure, is that a well-known, does it have well-known properties? And that actually is not clear. Not clear. And I could see myself getting angry. And I didn't want to do that. You know, What's the use of being angry from North Oxford about something that's a big success? Um, I tell you a, a film I have seen, which I do recommend, is The Corporation. That's a great film. I like that. And I encourage all my students to go and see that because that comes a little bit closer to actually the corporate decision-making logic that I think is tangible and you could make a difference on. Well, thank you very much for a uh, Now, before everybody leaves, uh, we have a couple of presents for you. Oh, well. First of all, Notre Dame's own Matt Kaushar, for those of you who have seen it, an excellent book. Um, excellent, thank wonderful you. Wonderful pictures of our university. And secondly, we have this uh, small gift, which right. you can open it up and <laughs> <Yeah>. show them. <laughs> so rude. <laughs> Good, thanks. Right, this is more complicated than I thought. <laughs> Oh, wow. Cool. Fantastic. Very nice. Oh. Excellent. I just have to get it on the plane tomorrow. So thank you very much for coming, and, and thank you very much for sharing these ideas. Sure.